It's just no estate planner, no estate planner ever likes to see these kind of things happen. It's awful. It's awful. And I just wish more clients would let us work and maintain the plan so that if we get an inkling that something's coming up or could come up, you know, maybe we can deal with it. Because don't forget, when you go to an estate planner and we've just met you as a client, nobody can foresee all the issues. That's why it's good to involve an accountant who's been representing the family for 20 or 30 years. They may have insights into the family dynamics that an estate planner may not realize. And when things change, because they often change, why it's important to have a pattern of going back uh, for review. Do you want to talk about the Green Book for just a couple of minutes? I don't know that it's worth too much more than that right now. No, I mean, yes, sure. What what do you want to say? Oh, you don't want to talk about it? It's scary. I, mean, I think... It's scary to think about because what I will say is it shows that the Biden administration understands what we're doing and wants to stop Planners. some of our best techniques. They they understand what they understand these installment sales to defective grant or trusts. They understand these discounts. They understand a lot of these estate tax planning techniques that are not well known to John Q. Public. They, they they have our number. So the question is, are they going to have enough votes to do away with this planning? The other question is, I'm a big believer of survival of the fittest. And you see these wealthy families and they're not doing any planning. I don't they understand won't that. Won't be around. They won't be around after these laws cha- change and it's too late to take the life raft out. It's It's very interesting to watch that, isn't it, Marty? I, I see it all the time. I had a conversation with a new client. It's like a $50 million net worth client. And he thought about everything we talked about and says, you know, I want to hire you, but what I want to do right now is just develop a plan. I don't want to do anything, but if we have a plan, then we'll think about it. I said, I'm t- you can do anything you want. I'm happy to just have a meeting and, and put together a memo and help you develop a plan, but I think you're making a terrible mistake. There is simply no way to predict when things will change. And oh, by the way, Usually, if you're doing good planning, there's asset protection benefits, there's divorce protection benefits. I mean, why not just do it? You know, these kinds of proposals by uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, Von Hollen, um, et cetera, these have been floated for years and years. I, I, I think Sanders, Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders is proposing similar changes, some of them similar, for more than a decade now. One day, a lot of these things may just get enacted. It may not be now, it may not be in 2024, it's going to happen. But why on earth wait to see if it happens? And by the way, what Alan was talking about with the the recent revenue ruling, you know, the senators, um, I I don't know, petitioned is is a fair word, pressured, encouraged, uh, secretary, you know, Treasury Secretary Yellen to to try to encourage the IRS to try to issue rulings to to, uh, change some of this. You don't, you know, some of this may come from the legislative side. Alan, remember the 2704 was it B-regs some years ago that would have almost eliminated discounts except for active operating companies? And it it really would have put a dent in a lot of the planning people do. I mean, some of this stuff may come through a legislative uh, avenue. And like I said earlier, we have no idea what kind of deals may be made when the, the various uh, people in Washington are negotiating on the debt ceiling. Maybe some of this stuff gets thrown in the mix as part of a deal, you don't know. What, what, what was it, the uh, pothole bill, as we affectionately called it, that brought us basis consistency reporting? I mean, that was just a, a, a crazy highway bill that they patched, no pun intended, patched onto it um, some um, provisions that dealt with the state consistency in reporting that are incredibly complicated. So anything can happen. Don't wait. Don't wait. As Alan said, this stuff could unravel uh, future use of many of the techniques that most estate planners use. Right, I think but, insurance, insurance and charity are okay, but I'm not sure if much else is. Not even all charity. Well, especially the ability to sell assets to a to a disregarded trust in exchange for a low interest mm-hmm. note. Interest rates are going up, and that's based on a revenue ruling. So they could reverse the ability to make these sales. So definitely be on your toes for the wealthy clients. And by the way, let me just caveat wealthy. Even if you're under the exemption, keep in mind it's getting cut in half in 2026. 
if you're 50 years old and still growing your estate and still investing and still doing business and you're at a $10 million level, just project that forward at a 6% rate of growth. And you're probably doing better if you're involved in a, in a closely held business. You're going to end up with a pretty large taxable estate at some point. Why wait? And if you get good asset protection in the interim, what's the downside? Let me tackle the next topic because I think we're, we're approaching the end of our hour. Um, this is something that I just see off radar all the time, and it really needs a little more attention. And it just, it's not in the, the, the swim lane of any particular advisor. And what am I talking about? Agent confusion. There are so many different things that we can do that put different people in power of different aspects of our life. The common thing you'd think of is, oh, I'm going to sign a power of attorney and go to a, a smart estate planner like Alan. I say, I need a power of attorney. You know, I'm 66 years old and I got to have a power of attorney. Name my wife, name my kid, name this, name that, do it. He does a power of attorney. That's fine. But is that the only document? Maybe if I'm thinking a little broader, which I encourage all of you to do, I'll do a revocable trust as well. And I'll actually put assets in it, not just keep it as a standby. Is there coordination between who the trustee is and who the agent are? If they're different, is it intentional? But that's just the starting point. People name, I have a client I met with this morning, a new client. Every account they have is joint POD, pay on death, TOD, transfer on death, with different mixtures of kids. There's just no way each of those kids is going to coordinate with the siblings they named as agents under their power of attorney. you got to have coordination. Who's going to be in charge? And if my agent is named, if I name my wife under my power of attorney, but I got kids or a, a friend like Alan under, um, you know, as a co-owner on accounts or as a TOD or POD on an account, who who's going to be responsible for long-term care insurance because of the lapse rate on long-term care policy? Long-term care companies have to have you designate someone to get a lapse notice. Is that the same person as your agent? Is it somebody else? And one of the things, and you, you see a whole list here, and I, there, there's even more that could come up. Social security, funeral agent. You may have a pulse, a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. That's medical. But are all these things coordinated? Do you have track of them? And what happens when you name different people in charge of different positions, and then a decade goes by, and you're not even talking to these people? If I go back and meet with Alan as my estate planner, he's going to update my power and health proxy and living will. But not all these other things necessarily. Alan, any comments or thoughts? What's, what is the recommendation, Marty? You keep a chart of all these people and check it every year or two, make sure that they'll all have access to what they'll need. And who gets I, the password think, to my Facebook account? The point is you got to start looking at all this stuff. And that's another good point. If you don't have the right credentials, the agent under the power of attorney, how are they going to get into your account? If you have a temporary disability and you're you're hospitalized for four months, it may take longer than that for them to find out the passwords to get into your bank account online. So there's a lot of practical implications. And I think one of the take-home points is it's not just about the sexy estate tax savings. It's not just about the fancy trust, you know, oh, I got a I got a non-reciprocal spousal lifetime access trust in Alaska, and I can tell everyone when I'm going golfing with them about this cool trust I have. And it's a non-grantor trust, so I can use SLANT as the acronym instead of SLAT, so it even sounds more intriguing. you got to look at a lot of these basic fundamentals, because if you get sick or if you have an issue, these little details make a huge, huge difference. And this slide will help get you going and get you started on it. Um, community property. Alan, do you want to just make a few comments on that? And then I think we're we're getting close to to wrapping up because the rest so, can go through pretty quickly. So if you if you live in California, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, or Wisconsin, one of the other community property states, what you have accumulated during the marriage is called a community property. It doesn't matter which spouse owns it. On the first death, you get a new income tax basis, which is a good thing. But if one of you gets sued, you lose everything which is a not bad a thing. thing. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. So you move to Florida or you move to New Jersey. You're now not living in a community property state, but your community property is still community property. So do you transmute out of it? Do you want to stay in it? it? It makes big differences as to how you handle it. If it is community property, then on death, half of it still belongs to the surviving spouse. 
So you just have to really understand it. Plus, you could set up what's called a community property trust in a state like Alaska or Florida. And Tennessee, put your outfit in South it. Dakota. South Dakota, Kentucky. And then on the first death, you could get a new income tax basis. So the planner has a lot of things to think about nowadays, especially as many people who are actually leaving California, fleeing those higher taxes and leaving Texas. Uh, very, very complicated, but interesting area. Don't forget that it exists. I think what, just to highlight one of the points Alan made, if you lived in a community property state, married, and then you moved out, it may be off everybody's radar. If you're the client, you got to make sure your attorneys, your tax advisors all know, yes, we were living in Arizona. We may have community property. I don't understand what it is, but we were living in a community property state. Make sure they know it. Let me just make a couple of comments and Alan comment on, you know, jump in. One, I have a client with community property. They have stock that's community property. Husband wants to put that stock in a spousal lifetime access trust for wife. I said to the attorney in the state that's doing the transmutation agreement to make it non-community property, he wants to just transmute it from community property to husband's name and husband's going to make a gift. I said, I don't think so. What I think you want to do is transmute it, which means it's going to go 50-50 to husband and wife because it's community. I said, you better wait at least a couple of months. I'd prefer longer, but at least a couple of months because if husband is going to make gifts, did that have a taint to the wife's interest in it? Now, the attorney there says, I don't really agree with you. I don't think that a step transaction doctrine risk or issue could apply to severed community property. I don't know, but I'd rather be careful if we can. Next, they actually want to give all the stock to that trust. I said, well, what I would do is sever it. I'd wait at least 30 days, 60 if you can, maybe more. Have wife gift assets to husband. Have husband then wait another several months minimum and do some stuff with the assets in the meantime, if he can, do shareholders agreement, a di di dividend distribution before he makes a gift, because I think that's another layer potentially of step transaction issue. So when you're dealing with community property, it's not only the step up and, and who gets it, but lots of issues. Last quick point, if husband and wife take community property and divide it, and then husband puts the community property assets after waiting at least several months, and there's no fine line. Maybe six months is better. Maybe 30 days is enough. I'm, I'm not commenting. I'm just making a suggestion. If you can, 60 days is what I would hope would be a minimum. If you can, don't always have the time. But if the husband then makes a gift to a spousal lifetime access trust that the wife's a beneficiary of, think of what happens if there's a divorce. So if it was $100 that came out, wife now owns 50. It used to be 100 of community, which means each half. She now owns 50. He set up a trust for her with 50. So she's really kind of got all the money and he's got nothing out of it. So just keep in mind what all this means is uh, just sort of echoing Alan's point. There's lots of um, um, twists and turns and complications with community property. Alan, why don't you make any kind of summation closing comments you would like? Marty, you do a wonderful job with your newsletter. So conscientious on uh, <laughs> looking at all of this. Letting me participate in these uh, webinars is something I, I really appreciate. I look forward to. I always learn a lot and I always enjoy it. And I always thank, appreciate thank that you, you have a different different view of everything than me. But by the way, everyone, that's that's important. And that's why I like speaking with Alan. If you know, it's like an old joke. If you put three estate planners on a desert island and ask them a tax question, you get five answers, right? There's a lot of different views on things. And so much of what we do is not only uncertain, but it's so fact sensitive. You want to be careful. And hopefully some of the take home points are even a simple, common, ubiquitous planning tool like an insurance trust. Pay some attention to it. Give it a little give it a little love and care because there's lots of interesting issues that come up even on simple trusts. Get ready for the Corporate Transparency Act. It's coming and it's gonna be a pain in the neck and there's severe penalties. And take a look at all those different little agent appointments, even the things that seem trite and sort of off radar because they may come back and, and make brief, if not for you, for your heirs and you wanna to try to address it. Thank you, Alan, for participating. It was fun. We'll do the next one together too. And thank you everyone for joining. And please keep in mind all these comments are for educational purposes only.
I should say entertainment too, shouldn't I? I think entertainment. Yes. What could be more entertaining than talking about grantor trusts? Take exactly. care, everybody. Right. Take care.